Can you all hear me uh, well? Patik. Um, so last weekend we had a more scientifically minded conference uh, here and if you are interested in that stuff about the ego tunnel, consciousness, the self, mind wandering, you will already find that in the internet as videos, uh, I understand. Today um, I want to just in the next 50 minutes or so provide you uh, with a summary of a non-technical, non-academic paper I wrote about three, four years ago <laughs> and which is also freely available. It's an open access paper. Everybody can download this from the internet. I saw there were two copies here that immediately disappeared. Um, so the general question I want to ask together with you in, in the next 50 minutes or so is could there be um, a fully secularized form of spirituality? Are you doing the... Um, okay. So what I'm interested in uh, today is um, the relationship between spirituality and intellectual honesty and the question if there could be a fully secularized version of uh, spirituality. Mm. Maybe that's not even a coherent thought. Uh, maybe you cannot even describe this idea with getting into logical con uh, contradictions. But at the same time, it seems <coughs> that is actually absolutely what we need on the world right now. So I want uh, this talk as a very simple structure. I want to ask three questions. What is spirituality? I want to ask what is intellectual honesty? and what I'm interested in, philosophy is concept science, is there a conceptual connection between these two stances toward life or one's own mind? Again, this is a non-technical talk, um, this is not an academic philosophy talk, but still I want to uh, try to defend three theses in a very informal manner with you, three claims. So the first claim would be that the opposite of religion is not science, but spirituality. Um, the ethical principle of being intellectually honest can be analyzed as a special case of the spiritual stance. And in their purest form, <coughs> the scientific and the spiritual stance actually emerge from the same value, from the ba same basic normative idea. But let's look at it. Um, so, in Western philosophy, spirituality has a long history, many, uh, um, you know, many centuries of thought. I will start <coughs> with a simple working uh, definition. You could ask, is spirituality a state, uh, a property of certain states of consciousness, of a way of experiencing the world? I'll treat it as a property of persons, spiritual persons are people who have an epistemic stance. Episteme is the Greek word for knowledge. So um, spiritual persons will be those that seek knowledge and a growth of knowledge and not faith. That is, it is about some specific form of knowledge and the objects of this form of knowledge, what it is directed as, can be clearly conceptualized. So I'm summing up stuff from many different spiritual traditions uh, in the world and they almost all agree that you can't even form a clear concept of what that object that you want to know about is but possibly it corresponds to that kind of knowledge that in the past religion and metaphysics were directed at. It is completely unclear whether something like a method of the spiritual stance exists as well. As you know, this is a, a debate that's going on for many centuries. There are practices, paths, letters, masters, and there are other people who say um, it is none of this. There's nothing that can be practiced, nothing that can be transmitted, nothing that can be taught. It can only happen in an instant. It's not a question of time. The first step is the last step. And maybe this is even both true at the same time. 
but let's have a closer look. So it's an epistemic stance of persons where the relevant form of knowledge is non-theoretical. Many <coughs> different traditions agree on that. It's not about finding the right theory about the world. Non-propositional is philosophers speak and it means it's not about true sentences. You will not have a sentence you can utter in the end that is true. Um, it's non-cognitive. It has nothing to do with <coughs> high-level symbolic thought or concepts, rather with the ending of all of that. And the kind of knowledge that is sought, many people converge on, is non-discursive. That's again philosophers speak for something you cannot talk about that you could never discuss, that you could not communicate through language. But what it is, is a sp specific form of self-knowledge, but not any form of self-knowledge. Uh, it seems to be an existential kind of self-knowledge that spiritual persons seek. And it has also has a normative component of being becoming whole, of progressing, of becoming complete in a certain sense that is always then very diffuse and often not easy to understand. But these two elements you find in almost any uh, traditions, an existential form of self-knowledge and a way of becoming non-completed and whole in a certain manner. So this is very little, you know, by the standards of academic philosophy that is almost no definition of spirituality. It's very little that we know and we only know what it is not. Now from the many centuries of Western philosophy, I'm not going to bore you with this, I just brought you one quote. The Bishop of, of Paris, he would have said something like that in roughly 1200. Spirituality is the perfection by which we first of all ward off from our souls spiritual evils which are vices and sins. By this we likewise seek for our souls spiritual goods which are all the virtues and gifts of the graces. That's of course only one example and the main point is that there is something like brutalitas. Brutalitas is the Latin concept which is the opposite of spiritualitas. That's what the brutes have. And the idea is uh, that because of the original sin, we are like brutes. Brutality rules our minds. And spirituality is exactly that which has nothing to do with our animal instincts. It is also that what no animal is capable of. That would be an example of an idea. So here they had these con two concepts, brutality and spirituality. Uh, to lead a spiritual life would mean not to be a mere brute, right? And to liberate yourself from your animal instincts. Now, <coughs> let us look at a more, this is a theological notion, at a more philosophical uh, concept of what spirituality could be. One that is more interesting, I think. So here is a quote from Kay, for I maintain that the only spirituality is the incorruptibility of the self. And that will be the notion I'm interested in today, I think because that's a truly interesting and a philosophical notion of what spirituality could be. The harmony between reason and love. So the point, of course, in speaking about incorruptibility of the self is most interestingly, of not being corrupt towards yourself, you know. How can anybody be incorruptible with regard to their own vicious desires, their inner lives, whatever arises? That is the more interesting question. So, keeping this in mind, um, let us um, move on. There's a bit more to be said about intellectual honesty. I think most of you have uh, thought about spirituality a lot in your lives. And <coughs> maybe intellectual honesty is a new word for you. And um, let's again start with a very simple working definition. 
The most simple one is that you just refuse to lie to yourself. Whatever happens on the level of thinking of intellectual activity. So <coughs> intellectual honesty again is an ethical stance. It has to do with an ethics of the inner life because uh, it relates to inner actions towards what one thinks. Probably most of you have thought about what ethical action is, eating meat or not. But a more interesting question is, could there be an ethics for what you do with your mind as well? To what one, what, what one believes, so what kind of beliefs do you make your own and integrate? And which ones don't you make your own? Is there an ethical point there about what to believe and no, what not to believe? That's what intellectual honesty is about. So this is about seeking a specific form of moral integrity, but not on the level of outer actions, but on the level of your own mind. Now here's the most horrible philosophical term, I didn't manage to delete it uh, in, in the talk, doxestic autoregulation. That's uh, how academic philosophers talk, I'm not going to even uh, explain it. The question is how you go about what you will believe and what you will not believe in your life. Uh, will you accept only rational argument and evidence, for instance? But it also <coughs> aims at making what you know and what you believe coherent. So normal ethics will have an ideal of moral integrity where you try that your, mat your actions are coherent with your values, right? That's the normal idea of moral integrity. Here we would think that you basically shouldn't believe anything that you don't know, and that's very little. So <coughs> Intellectual, intellectual honesty has to do with having only <coughs> evidence-based beliefs. And most of all, <coughs> that the process of inquiry, the process of thinking logically, the process of investigating, does not serve your emotional needs. So that you do not do all these things because you want to achieve a form of emotional security, for instance, or positive feelings. So that is an important thing. Um, thinking should not be abused to serve your emotional needs, like feeling at home in the universe, uh, or having a high sense of self-esteem, or feeling secure. Those are emotional needs. Intellectual <coughs> honesty <coughs> has nothing to do with that. So what I've brought for you to give you the flavor of this are four examples from our own tradition. How people thought about intellectual honesty and maybe you find this inspiring. So there was British philosopher John Locke, for instance, and he thought that intellectual honesty is a moral obligation that we actually have towards God. If you will, this was step one. It's an obligation to God and he said things like he that believes without having any reason for believing may be in love with his own fancies, but neither seeks truth as he ought, nor pays the obedience due to his maker. So that was a pretty revolutionary step at that time uh, to tell people that God does not want you to have faith in him. You know, that's not what he wants. He wants you to try to discover him, um, to actively try to know him. Let's go uh, one more step in Western history of philosophy. There was Immanuel Kant in his work Religion Within the Boundaries of Mere Reason. And he said intellectual honesty <coughs> is the sincerity of the intention of being honest towards yourself. So now it's not an obligation you have towards God. In the Western Enlightenment, it turned around, it's an obligation you have to yourself. You actually have a moral obligation of being honest to yourself. But note the subtlety in this. Of course you could fail. But what counts 
is the purity of the intention, you know. And that is some bo something nobody can teach you. That is also something not found in books. Uh, and that's something you can't fake because nobody's looking anyway, right? Uh, you're completely alone with yourself. So how pure, how sincere is your intention of being honest toward yourself? Uh, Kant, in the language of its time, even said, that is the idea of the moral good in its absolute purity. He said that is the, uh, the, the deepest core of trying to be a moral, ethical human being. The sincerity of this intention not to fool yourself. He said other things. He, for instance, if there's intellectual honesty, I don't know if you've thought about it, there's intellectual dishonesty. Uh, and he called it the inner lie, the, uh, the act <coughs> of lying to yourself. And he said, this is actually, interestingly, a form of being unconscious, unmindful, unaware, and it's a lack of conscientiousness. That was the idea at that time. It's a loss, it's a way of losing awareness, actually. So man's duty to himself, regarded merely as a moral being, is truthfulness. That's uh, the point. Uh, insincerous, insincerity is a mere lack of conscientiousness. Here's a very different next stop in the development. So here's Friedrich Nietzsche, thus spoke Zarathustra. The unconditional will to truth. That's the third defining criterion. You have a will to knowledge that is unconditional. You will not stop. You, know. you will not stop by anything, not even by yourself. And he called it the conscience behind the conscience. And he said things like, where my honesty ceases, I am blind and I also want to be blind. But where I want to know, I also want to be honest, namely venomous, venomous, rigorous, vigorous, cruel, and inexorable. So there was no nonsense there. So, and there was a deeper thought. I will just briefly mention this. The idea was that this absolute will to truth went through a history of Western thinking to different stages. And intellectual honesty is like the last oops uh, is like the last stage, the last virtue in the whole Christian Greek history of ideas, because the religious moral interpretation of the will to truth destroys itself. you know first, it was an obligation towards God, then it was an obligation to yourself. it was a religious way or a moral way of seeking this knowledge. And this completely annihilates itself in the will to be open to any form of criticism and any form of inquiry, which is, of course, the idea of modern science. Now, here's one last man, William Kingdon Clifford, who wrote a very in influential book, The Ethics of Belief. And this is, again, somebody from the Anglo-Saxon tradition who generally was more analytically clear than my own tradition over there on the continent. So he had these two principles. I wonder if you could follow him. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence, period. Second principle, at any time and any place, and for every person, it is equally wrong to ignore or carelessly re reject the relevant evidence for one's own beliefs. For instance, <coughs> ignoring scientific evidence, right? Uh, that was the idea. He would not say uh, you would be sinning to God or lying to yourself, but he would say about people who do that last thing, I, uh, ignore relevant evidence, that they, their life is one whole sin towards humanity. So you shouldn't sin to humanity, to the ideal of humanity. So much for my three uh, examples.
But now for the unpleasant part of this talk, um, what exactly does it mean to be intellectually honest in 2017? Um, we don't want to fool ourselves, right? So I've brought you three examples, and I'll tell you what I think it means uh, today. The first example is religion. The second example is life after death. And the third example is enlightenment, the issue of enlightenment. Let's start with religion. So conceptually, I'll just tell you this as a philosopher, after 2,500 years, there is no convincing argument for God's existence in the history of Western philosophy. There are a lot of proofs. There will be people who disagree with me, but I just tell you this. If there was a logical proof for the existence of God, you would know it. You would all know it in the room. So this is something. Um, all proofs of God's existence fail. And the no normal way out for many of us is to become an agnostic. That is, okay, I'll be open to this question. I will withhold judgment. But that is actually probably not an option because the burden of proof is on the side of those, the theists, the people who want to believe in God. What do I mean by this? Imagine mm, uh, you say, come on, the Easter bunny doesn't exist. You know, there's no scientific evidence, no rational argument. And then you meet this very gentle spiritual person who says, well, I'll just withhold judgment. I'm very open. I'll be agnostic about the Easter bunny. That would be a little weird, you know. It says, I will just stay open about if the Easter bunny exists or not. But it's the same logical situation. The burden of proof is on the believer in the Easter bunny. Uh, today. So, spiritual, um, empirically, of course, that's very trivial. There is no empirical evidence uh, for the existence of God, but we have an increasing number of convincing theories about how religiousness evolved in human beings. And evolutionary psychology today gives us a lot of knowledge about how metaphysical belief systems actually evolved in human beings. Religion today is being naturalized, as they say, in academia. Academia is, is a problem that is being handed over to the natural sciences. How could this come about, you know, that people actually become religious? It's a booming research area. But please note, again, that intellectual honesty, what we're talking about, is exactly that property that no theologian and no representative of any organized religion can have. They like to pose like it, they would like to have it, but that's exactly what you cannot have. So, brought um, two examples for you. One of your most famous philosophers in America, Daniel Dennett, how can we account for mistaken beliefs, bizarre delusions, and instances of self-deception? That just gives you an idea. There's a lot of research about the evolution of self-deception. And for many of the experts, it's clear that religious faith is a prime example of self-deception that evolved. This is one of the most famous theoretical biologists in the world, Robert uh, Trivers, and his colleague in Australia, Bill von Hippo. And they have worked a lot on the evolution and psychology of self-deception. I'm not going to bore you with this, but an interesting point seems to be that a function of self-deception is to deceive others better. So imagine you are a politician and you have to lie to thousands of people all the time. And we human beings are very good cheat detectors because we lie to each other all the time. We also, there's an arms room, we've, we've become very good at detecting cheaters. So when Goebbels gives a talk and thousands of people watch him, everybody's looking for body language for subtle signs that this guy, you know, is a fraud. The only thing that works is if a speaker, a demagogue, a religious leader goes into a full state of delusion while he speaks. 
because then he will give off no signs, you know, su no subliminal signs, and it'll be really convincing. That's one of the ideas. So Robert Trivers says the conventional view that natural selection favors nervous systems which produce <coughs> ever more accurate images of the world must be a very naive view of mental evolution. Mental evolution created self-deception. The most simplest example is, is if you measure it, all parents directly perceive, not think about, directly perceive their own children as more intelligent and cute than other children. It's built into our hardware. It was good, right, um, to self-inceive in this way. So new research shows that in many cases there was an evolution of systematically falsely representing reality. There clearly is an evolution of self-deception. Animals have that too, for instance, in courtship behavior or in threatening each other. And we find that in many cases, positive illusions, mechanisms of denial and repression, and delusional models of reality, enhanced reproductive success of our ancestors. It was good to have more children. So the central problem for our species now, that most animals don't have, is that at about the age of eight, I don't know, can you remember when it was in your life, when you first understood that all human beings die? It's typically between 8 and 10. Everybody has this moment, we discover that we will die. And that's a problem. The insight into our own mortality is a problem we have to manage all our life. And the idea is that we evolve complex forms of self-deception. So, I call this adaptive delusional systems that have evolved in the history of mankind. And here you see two representatives uh, of such adaptive delusional systems. Um, Pope Pio Pius XII uh, and a man from my country. And there's an interesting system, uh, but there's an interesting uh, difference. I don't know uh, if you see the difference. This man wanted to found a thousand-year-iges Reich, a 1,000-year empire, right? But they only lasted 12 years. This product stays in the market for 2,000 years. <laughs> yeah, this is a serious question. What's the difference? I think the main mistake Hitler made is that he didn't offer a way of mortality denial. He didn't tell a story about an afterlife. Because that is what motivates people. So um, what is an adaptive delusional system good for? It makes large groups cohesive. You can fight against the non-believers. It stabilizes internal hierarchies. Just think of the church and the politicians for centuries. And it organizes functionally adequate forms of self-deception. And this may have to do with the evolution of religion. Religion came from many sources, and it started with burial rites, burial objects, ancestor cults, probably. But one of the central functions uh, in religion is to help people deny their own mortality. Right? I taught you, told you this would be the unpleasant uh, part of uh, the talk. And in your own country, you have this adaptive delusional systems take many forms, right? Uh, so you have the religious right in government now in Washington, but you also have the Wall Street financial criminals in Washington. They pray to another god. You know, it's another kind of system, but it makes groups very effective. Uh, fighting a war against the poor in this world. But uh, there are very different kinds of mortality denial. Think of Silicon Valley, tech evangelists. There is the singularity church. You know, there is the new techie religion of transhumanism. I would say the main function is help people to deny their own mortality, but in a little cooler way you know, uh, for computer scientists. Um, so let's go to the second step, life after death. 
Conceptually, I just report to you that in current philosophy of mind, practically nobody endorses the position of substance dualism. There are some people, very smart people, but even those who are anti-reductionists, there are about nine different models for solving the mind-body problem, the relation between um, um, the brain and consciousness. But even those people who say consciousness is not reducible to physical properties or information processing properties in the brain, none of them argue for personal survival after death. Even those people who say it's conceptually irreducible, the mind and consciousness, they don't think that there is a thing, an entity like a soul that could survive independently of the brain after it has disappeared. I'm just reporting the situation to you. Um, empirically, in current consciousness research, and I'm really in this uh, for three decades, almost nobody assumes that life after death is a real possibility. Um, a functioning brain, whatever else you think seems uh, is a necessary condition for conscious states to arise. Even the anti-reductionists will subscribe to something like this, if all properties of your brain are fixed, then all properties of what you will consciously experience are determined as well. Even the anti-reductionists will say that there is bottom-up determination. And the research homes in, in finding the neurocorrelate of consciousness. Here's a book I edited in 2000, Neurocorrelates of Consciousness for MIT Press. The basic idea is that for every conscious experience you have, there's some set of properties in your brain that reliably brings it about. You know, for every emotion, for the experience of redness and so forth, there is a neurocorrelate. You stimulate that with an electrode, you get the experience. Now let's come, we didn't want to fool ourselves, to the third topic. Um, and I should maybe make a footnote here uh, before I come to this. I'm, you do not have to believe this, right? I am not saying you should believe uh, any of this about life after death or so f and, and so forth, or the evolution of religion. That is not the point. To be intellectually honest just means to acknowledge the fact, to just be open to the fact that in the time in which we live, there's a very strong trend. There's a convergence between empirical sciences and philosophy in that direction. That's all. It's not that you have to become you know, a believing, uh, card-carrying materialist or reductionist or something like that. It is just about being able to face the fact because, uh, facts, because being with what is also means being with the scientific knowledge of your time. It doesn't mean to take on any specific position. So <clears throat> this is Robert Scharf of San Francisco, the director of the Center for Buddhist Studies, and I learned a lot of things from him. And one of the things I really learned from his writings is that in 25 centuries of discussions, Buddhist philosophers could never agree on what enlightenment is. It's only people in rich country in the West <laughs> who satisfy their emotional needs in New Age bookstores who know what enlightenment is, right? Uh, so if you go there from a philosophical perspective, there are no good arguments for saying that a single, well-defined, culturally invariant theory and description independent state of consciousness exists that can be identified as the enlightenment. Many of us want to believe this, that there is a philosophia perennis or it all converges and all these people have talked about the same thing. But if you go about this professionally, for instance, if you compare reports of middle-aged mystics with uh, Buddhist monks or people today, very superficially, you might want to say they're all experiencing the same thing. But if you take a closer look, the reports actually differ. And they differ if they come from a Christian culture, for instance, or if there's Advaita Vedanta in the back or something like that. So the question is, uh, if there's actually something that is independent from all descriptions and theories. And 
I don't think there is a well-defined notion out of what liberation could be. It looks bad. Mm. So, um, <laughs> empirically, there is a lot of meditation research now. And that is something that is very interesting, actually. That's a second wave of neuroscientific meditation research now. But how would it show? Some people hope that this will tell us what enlightenment is in the brain. But how would, I mean, have you ever thought about it? How could empirical science show something like this? It's completely absurd, you know. Uh, how would you design a research program that shows that by means of neuroscience and cognitive science and computational models? Um, I think there are a lot of conceptual problems there, and I think it cannot be shown um, empirically. So this already brings me to the very last part. We're already coming um, uh, uh, to the last part of this talk. What is the connection between spirituality and intellectual honesty? What's the connection? I asked these three questions at the beginning. Remember? What is it? And the third question was, is there a conceptual connection between these two stances? And you may remember that I also wanted to say th three things. The opposite of religion is not science, but spirituality. I would like to defend that the ethical principle of being intellectually honest is actually a special case of being spiritual. I think many scientists, although they would completely not want this to be true, are very spiritual persons, you know, honest, serious researchers, um, but they would hate the label. And in their purest forms, the scientific and spiritual stance emerge from the same basic normative idea. In the same way of what I just said, you could say that, for instance, early yogic practice or something like that, maybe even magic in the Middle Ages, were pro pro uh, precursors of what today we call the science of consciousness. These were people who went about investigating consciousness in a very serious and systematic way, long before there was academic philosophy or neuroscience or something like that. These were, so many of the spiritual, more serious spiritual paths can of course be seen as investigations in the scientific spirit. So let's have a look. So I said this. <clears throat> what would it mean that the opposition of religion is not science, but spirituality? So religion is the cultivation of a delusional system, right? There is this technical concept of fideism in theology and philosophy, and that's the pure point of view of pure faith. If you're a fideist, you reserve the right for yourself to believe whatever you want to believe in the face of whatever contradicting evidence. Um, that's the most robust thing. And of course, having faith, one could uh, argue that actually all forms of religion are fundamentalist in this sense. Spirituality is just the opposite. It's this epistemic st state stance because it aims at insight and not at delusion. Religion maximizes emotional profit. Um, it's about feeling good. Yeah. It's about stabilizing your self-esteem in the face of a horrible discovery that you will die. Um, spirituality searches for direct experiences, but not for emotional profit. You may know that the spiritual kind of self-discovery, nobody ever said that this leads to emotionally attractive results. I know some people in, in California like to make people believe it is, but would you also be interested in self-discovery if the emotional results would be very unattractive? Um, so religion sacrifices rationality for making the self-model in your brain, as I call it, coherent. You self-deceive, you, you know, delete rational argument, you sacrifice your own rationality for good feelings. Spirituality, on the other hand, is that process in which 
the self ends. Maybe not even a process. Maybe something that cannot be a process because it can only be at this instant. So dogmatism um, is the philosophical thesis that you are entitled to believe, to, to hold on to a belief for the sole reason that you already have it. Right? Uh, it's an old human uh, way of looking at things and that's intellectually dishonest, of course, where spirituality is more subscribed to the ideal of truthfulness. And I must say, as a non-native speaker, I, I'm never quite sure if sincerity would be the better word. I don't know. Um, so I call it the ideal of truthfulness. Spiritual people, you can tell them by the fact that they will be always open for rational arguments. Dogmatic movements organize themselves. Typically, spirituality is a radically individual thing. It starts with the insight that you're completely alone and that nobody really can help you. There may be signposts, but it starts with the insight that this whole teacher-disciple uh, teacher relationship is itself part of the problem. Dogmatic people evangelize. Spiritual people typically are quiet. So the second thing I said was ethical uh, intellectual honesty can be analyzed as a special case of the spiritual stance. Let's look at this. So spirituality is aimed at insight and is characterized by an unconditional will to knowledge. Scientists have a rational methodology and they systematically go about this. This is industrial style, trying to maximize the growth of knowledge. Spiritual people search for direct experience, but scientists do something very similar. They do experiments. They, s they are strictly data-driven. It's the same uh, strategy. Spiritual people dissolve what they take to be their own self, and scientists do something very similar. They try to falsify their own theories. I'm going to bring you an example of that. A good scientific theory is one where you can specify the conditions under which it will crash. And every good scientist tries to show that what he believes uh, is actually false. So spiritual people will be open for rational arguments. Scientists minimize the ontological assumptions they make. Spirituality is something radically individual. Science is a highly organized enterprise today. There is quietness. But scientists will disseminate knowledge. So here's an example. I don't know if you know Karl Popper. This will be a last uh, example. The founder of critical rationalism. Famous Austrian philosopher. And he said, if we want to touch reality, we touch it in the very moment our hypothesis is falsified, when our theories fail. That's when we are in touch with reality. And I brought you one quote. He quotes, I am not prepared to accept anything that cannot be defended by means of argument or experience. That's dogmatic rationalism, right? And then he says, now it is easy to see that this principle of an uncritical rationalism is inconsistent for, since it cannot, in its turn, be supported by argument or experience. It implies that it should itself be discarded. There's no way that you can uh, 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 show that you should become a dogmatic rationalist by rational argument or empirical evidence. So this dissolves itself. Let's come to the last thesis. I think in their very purest forms, the scientific and the spiritual approach to things actually come from the same basic normative idea. And now it gets complicated for, I guess, two more slides and then you're almost there. Right? So there are two, thing, two ways in which we human beings can act. One way we can act is with our body. We can walk and talk. The other thing is, we can walk with our mind by thinking logically, by calculating in our minds, by planning, 
by actively imagining something, by visualizing something, and by meditating, for instance. Um, that's a form of interaction, bringing gently and precisely the focus of your attention back to your breath, for instance. That is a very subtle form of mental action. Now the question is, is there an ethics for mental action as well? Are there things that you should or should not do on the level of your mind? The Christian philosophers discussed a lot about it. If you imagine, you know, betraying your wife with your neighbor's wife, is that just virtual reality and it's cool? And Augustine, many of the Christian philosophers uh, said it's not virtual reality, it's sinning, you know. You must not sin in your mind. That's the classical idea. So thinking, you could form a concept about enlightenment, God, and you could make a certain belief your own. And you could act with attention by concentrating or by moving into a state of choiceless awareness, observing and letting go. These are two main ways of controlling your own attention. I want to draw your attention today to the fact that there's a single ethical attitude that connects both of these types of action scientific thinking and, for instance, concentration or choiceless awareness. They are connected. Now the last horrible slide, and then you've made it. Um, so there are two aspects to this. Remember in the beginning we said all of this has to do with the unconditional will to truth. The goal in both cases is insight and not belief. And there is a normative idea of being absolutely sincere. A certain idea of inner decency, if you will. Of being truthful to yourself, not lying. But that is turned. That's the second complicated point, and then you've done it. It's turned towards yourself. In both of these enterprises, the unconditional will to truthfulness is directed towards oneself. So, in spirituality, a classical example would be the practice of mindfulness, which is not just a mechanical thing you do, but as you get deeper into this observation, you have to be with a lot of ugly things, a lot of things about that you didn't want to know about yourself, your violent fa fantasies, your sexual fantasies, your past trauma, and there's no way, if you want to go deeper in this, if you don't want to just do a sugar-coated version, that you have to face all of this. And you cannot do it. This is not a technical thing, you know. This is nothing you can practice on a retreat if you don't have this unconditional will of being truthless, truthful towards yourself. And in scientific method, you have the very same thing, namely, a self-critical way of being strictly rational. Okay, I can take a deep breath and relax. So, uh, I think the connection between spirituality and intellectual honesty is that there is actually one ethics of inner action in spiritual practice and in the ideal of intellectual honesty. And I don't know if you've encountered this in your own life. Many people are on one side very strongly in their lives. There are people who are deeply engaged in some sort of spiritual uh, practice, but are deeply intellectually in, uh, dishonest and have some absurd belief systems they are attached to and uh, you know block out certain kinds of uh, criticism. And on the other hand, you have people who are very deeply in the scientific worldview and believe all these things the scientists tell you. I actually crippled human beings, uh, you know, uh, and completely blind uh, to that deeper dimension of life. So, there are thing, I think there are two basic forms of acting in the sake of gaining knowledge. One is through attention and mindfulness, and the other is through critical thought, through scientific rationality. And the only point I would like to discuss with you today, that's the only thing, is 
that I think there are good reasons um, to believe that one cannot flower without the other. Um, you cannot have a good critical scientific rationality uh, in the end that is not dogmatic from people who don't know this other dimension. And you cannot have any progress in that other dimension if you don't have a very strictly self-critical attitude and you're open to scientific evidence and rational arguments. So we may need both because I think ultimately you cannot have one without the other. Thank you very much for your attention.